Hi, Misha here, and from time to time, we like to do kind of a buyer's guide or a 101 basics video on well-known popular firearms, just to kind of help people. Now, these are not meant to be super detailed, super comprehensive videos, and we in no way purport to be experts but can share observations and things we've learned over the years. And while the P08 Luger firing 9mm Parabellum has in the past been the most famous and popular German military sidearm, in the 21st century, as Lugers become harder and harder to find, the Walther P-38 of World War II and post-war fame has started to get just as much recognition. And if you know me and Jay, we like Walthers and have done several history videos talking about the P-38. So if you really want to get more into the history and service, you can check those out. In this video, we're going to look at variants, things to look for, things to avoid, talk about a little bit about manufacturing changes and I'm doing this video now because I have a couple from each maker but one's about to go to a new home so it's either do it now or have uh, one less gun if I try it tomorrow so on the table we have several you've seen before we have my early production here's pistol HP Swedish contract from 1939. Then we have my German military P38 AC41. Then German military P38 AC43, so mid war. And the last from Walther, we have an AC45, very late war, probably made in March, maybe February, AC45. From there, I have one example of a Spree work. This is a pretty late production one, made in early 1945. And then finally we have two Messers. Got a, uh, a uh, by the way the Spree work is a CYQ, no year mark. Then we have a Mauser BYF-44, probably the most common P-38 code count encountered. And then finally we have one of my favorites of all time, just because it's cool, an SVW-45 Grey Ghost as it's nicknamed. Showing late war German Mauser and post-war production here. But we'll get to each of these. Just a five minute history, because I can't help myself. You know I can't. The P08 Luger really wasn't as unreliable and prone to jamming in World War I as some might make it out to be. But it was a 19th century first generation self-loading design. Maybe second generation if you're being super generous. And it was also getting rather expensive to produce. So once the Nazis came into power in 1933, they set about rearming Germany. Obviously, they needed a new self loading rifle. They needed a new bolt action rifle for more immediate use. And they wanted to replace the Luger. Now, the goal was to have a pistol that was faster and less resource intensive to produce than the Luger. Also, that required less truly skilled gunsmith-type labor to make. And, that still had the good ergonomics accuracy of the Luger, while being more reliable and easier for the soldiers to maintain in the field. So, several country, uh, companies would uh, create designs proposals, and Walther would start 
with their PP. First introduced in 1929, the PP was the world's first commercially available double action, single action gun with decocker. And this, of course, would evolve into the PPK. And so they started there and they scaled it up to fire 9x19 Parabellum, 9mm Luger as it's called. This had to go from being a blowback in the PP PPK to a locked breech. And uh, early models were the military pistol, MP, and the army pistol, AP. Both had concealed hammers. And then the last concealed hammer gun would arise around 1937, known as the MPF. And this would lead to the first exposed hammer prototype, the MPH which appeared in early 1938, and it was directly evolved into the HP here. You're not likely at all to find an MP or an AP, so yeah, no, they exist. That, that's all you need to know. HPs, though, do exist. In fact, 25,000 or so were made, so not a huge number, but not tiny. Many think that all HPs were made before World War II. This is not correct. In fact, only 7,000 were made before 1940, maybe 1941. The rest were built during World War II. Now, the HP was a commercial version, and the biggest single contract for them was to Sweden. They first ordered 1,000 in 1939, becoming the M39. And then they ordered 500 more in 1940. And they wanted more, but Walther was busy with German government orders, and Sweden's manufacturing in the time just could not build such an advanced gun. So they ended up doing the L40 Lottie. But they had their 1500. The remainder of the HPs would be on offer built in small batches when parts were available when the military didn't need them. Some would be private purchased by officers. Some would go to police. And a substantial number would go to the Austrian military who would continue to issue them with the BH marking after World War II. So if you see one with the BH, that's Austrian and sometimes they would scrub the Walther. Now these would be banner guns with Walther markings and they had some different features. They had a different shape to the side release, the decocker was different, the sights were slightly different, had a square firing pin, and maybe most noticeably they have the original kind of AP style grips that are checkered with a round lanyard hoop and hole. Early on, Walther offered both Bakelite and wood grips, but by 1940 the wood grip option was stopped and the German military never had wood grips. These were double single action. They kept a magazine of eight rounds. What was nice about having the decocker, this was one of the few military sidearms that was authorized in World War II to be carried with one in the pipe. Most other combatants in the war told their soldiers to carry empty and then discharge the gun when needed. There's problems with that, but anyway. And it's just a uh, very nice design. The locking system, the wedge system it uses, allows for quite good accuracy. In fact, this system was carried over, as you know, into the Beretta, like the 1951 and the uh, M9, M92 series. Overall, it's about 8.5 inches. Barrel is just a hair under 5 inches. And it weighs about 1 pound 12 ounces unloaded. Steel frame, steel slide. All World War II production P-38s and HPs were steel. They experimented with alloy frames, but they cracked under 9mm recoil because they just didn't have the metallurgy at the time. So, 
yeah, if you see an alloy frame, P38, it is post-war. Well, not to get too bogged down, the German military would adopt it as the pistol, 38, but would not receive its first examples until 1939. And these were kind of pre-production, so-called Zero series. They were done in th uh, three batches, totaling about 13,000 pistols, delivery between 1939 and 1940. And they early on looked much like the Swedish contract, but they would evolve changes, becoming more like this one here. This is an AC-41, so pretty early. And by April of 1940, the German government placed its initial first full order, and Walther was ordered to stop using the banner and use the code 48. Zero, 480. This was just the code system at the time. For example, Mauser was 42. But it wouldn't be long that August of 1940 they would change the code system and Walther was assigned the code AC. They would only build about 7,000 480 code Walthers. So they're quite rare and thus, if you see one, quite valuable. And early on, they would uh, proof mark a lot of parts. They would get high polished blued finish. They would have black, maybe dark brown grips, but not red. They would serialize the slide, frame, barrel, locking block, grip panels, and magazine, at least in the beginning. But, in 1941, the first round of shortcuts, expediencies for production, would occur at Walther. And by the end of 1941, they would go away from the pure high polish finish to more of a military polish finish. And they would stop serializing the grips and then serializing the magazine. So, if you're looking at a later AC-41, don't worry if the mag doesn't match it's not supposed to ditto for the grips now early on Walther made their grips in-house later they would use a subcontractor at least some of the time there was not really much in the way of mechanical changes and uh, the serial numbering system is interesting on these the HP's the commercial guns would run up to five digit serials pretty standard for example, the Swedish guns were 1,065 through around 2,600, usually with an H in front. But the German military wanted a different system. Now, one reason they used the code system was to kind of disguise production locations and numbers. Another way they wanted to kind of disguise production numbers in case their weapons were captured was by a unique serial system. So they started using a suffix. They would build either 10,000 or some people say 9,999 in a series and then they would roll over and add a suffix like A, B, C. The goal originally was to produce about 10,000 pistols a month so using a suffix block once a month. And at the end of the year Walther would roll over back to no suffix, and then ABC, and so on and so forth. They would two-digit date code, AC40, AC41, AC42, etc. And all of these together, the AC, the year code, and the serial, and finally the suffix, would be taken in German records as the full official prefix, excuse me, a serial number. So having basically a prefix for the factory and a suffix for the month. So even when they were trying to be random, the Germans couldn't help but organize. Whereas the Russians were much better at just random serials. And uh, while they had actually reached the goal by the spring of 1941, of approximately 10,000 pistols, a little less a month. So in its first full year of production, 1941, they would build about 100,000 pistols which they would continue through 42 and 43, roughly 100,000 per year. In 
1942, they would still have a nice quality pistol at Walther. Although the bluing would get more and more of a military style, less polishing, fewer proof marks in some locations, and um, the grips would start to get lighter in some instances because they were using more wood filler, less polymer. This is when the red and even sometimes kind of orange grips start to appear. It's also worth pointing out that German guns had inspector stamps. Waffenamps, these were applied by the inspectors from the Heer's office. Large factories like Walther had an officer assigned to them. Small factories had a roaming officer that kind of did a region. So in addition to the serial numbers and the AC code for Walther, they would have a number code. It would say 359 for Walther and they would add a WA in front of it as the war progressed. They would also, in 1943, make a few changes to the design to improve it. For one, the magazine body was slightly stretched to improve feeding. For another, they would add a hump in the frame right above the trigger, right where the trigger pin goes to reinforce the frame a little bit there. I never really heard of, have heard of cracking, but they felt it necessary, so I'm sure they, they knew what they were doing. The ejection port pretty much stay the same. They would change the extractor. Early on, it was kind of tapered in the back and fit it into a tapered notch slot in the slide. They would simplify this going away. This would speed up production, save a few machine steps, also made the extractor a little beefier. Notice it's on the left side. And there's your takedown catch. And with that, as far as takedown catches, let's do that because one thing you have to know about P-38s is if it has its original finish. Because a lot of these were kept in service after World War II, for example, in Russia, also East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and many others. So over the years, they would be re-blued. And that's okay, just know what you're looking at. So yeah, let's take her apart. These are pretty easy to do. Here's our magazine. Steel, eight shots with, with holes. Early on, they would be coded to the factories they came from. Later, they would use some subcontractors, such as JVD. They would not or should not have the uh, banner logo on them. And the P3H should have a period. And it will also have a small, very small sometimes, Waffen Amped Acceptance Stamp, too. Oh, and extended mags that were... Then with the new body style, they'd add a V next to the P-38. The frame, of course, would have the serial number. And the slide. And the barrel assembly under the barrel here. And finally, the locking block, the locking wedge here. So there are four serials on your typical wartime production P-38. Also of importance, an easy way to tell if one of these has been refinished, this locking block should be in the white. Now it's fine to have kind of a gold hue to it, but it should be in the white. Same goes with the cam pin in the back. If they're blued or blackened, then it's very likely they've been refinished. I won't, I won't ever say never say never that absolutely zero came out blued, but certainly earlier on, for sure, they should be in the white with maybe just a little coloration from heat treating or just aging. Another easy way to tell the selector for the fire mode originally had an S in white paint and an F in red paint. 
Although, if they're not painted, don't worry, a lot of times this just wore off from use. So that's less conclusive, but if you do have a little bit of white and red paint, even if it's just a freckle or two, that's a good way to know that it really hasn't been uh, touched up. Here's our internals. Notice it has two small guide springs for recoil. Very neat system. And the grips too will have markings and other kind of telltale mold signs and numbers on the inside, but I don't think we need to get into that. You'll notice too they got away from that checkered pattern early on. They went to this pattern. It was more durable, easier to keep clean. And they went to a simplified lanyard attachment for similar reasons. So, end of production at Walther. In 1944, they would actually step up their numbers, building around 130,000, and quality control would go down even further. Uh, very little final polishing was done. A lot of machine marks were left, and the bluing became a... Uh, matte military style. Also the grips became more and more frequently lighter colors as they were used. Then in late 1944 and into 1945 the final round of shortcuts were taken. I'm going to talk more about the grips in the slide stop when we get to the Mauser. Same goes for the cog hammer on this. But I will say that while Walther typically still kept bluing slide frame and barrel, they did start using some small parts that were phosphated rather than blued at this time. And this is pretty common in German production of all kinds of guns because phosphating was easier to do and protected the guns better, so why not? They would also, quite interestingly, in the, at the end of the war, if I can get this out, stop finishing the magazines. <laughs> they would leave them pretty much in the white or with a very basic primer type finish. They would also simplify the stamping, sometimes just putting a basic U. People have speculated what this means, but either way, late war mags may have P38 or they may have a U only. And they may not have a Waffen Amped. But guns that were accepted into military service would still have Waffen Amps. And in 1945, we don't know how many Walther made. Probably between 30 and 40,000. They certainly got through the B block into the C and even D. Although by the time you get to the D block, these tend to be guns that were incomplete when the factory was captured in April of 1945 and so they were actually assembled by Walther workers for US and Allied GIs probably to curry favor or get a pack of cigarettes or a meal so some of these D block guns will not have all the Waffen amps and will be mismatched numbers so if you find the D block and it's mismatched that might be literally how it left the factory Although it probably never saw German military service. Even guns in the B block and maybe even some in the A block that were made and accepted sometimes just sat at the factory because by this time the transportation, the infrastructure in Germany was pretty well broken down. So they just sat in crates. So yeah, because they started early, Walther produced the most... P-38s, well over 500,000. However, the other manufacturers would gamely try and catch up. So let's talk about Spree work. By 1940, it was clear that even when Walther met its goal of 10,000 a month, and even if it could sustain it indefinitely, the Germans would not have enough P-38s. 
So, first, Mauser, and then later, Spreewerk were ordered to tool up to produce the P-38. However, Spreewerk would beat Mauser to production because Mauser would resist, wanting to hang on to the P-08 Luger. Now, Spreewerk is an interesting case because it was in occupied Czechoslovakia. Nominally, the control headquarters were in Germany, but the factory was in Czechoslovakia. Meaning that, uh, yeah, pride and all that wasn't a huge deal. Now, these were pistols all made to spec. They all worked. But when you find weirdnesses, in fact, this one has one with the decocker, they most commonly show up in spree works for obvious reasons. Anywho, by June of 1942, they delivered their first test batch of 50 pre-production pistols, and they didn't pass inspection. So they were ordered to kind of shake things up and get their act together. And so by August, they delivered another test batch, and these were accepted. Now, early on, Spree Works, the first four or five hundred, were often built with quite a few Walther parts. But soon they would start building most of their own parts, except for the grips, which they would either use Walther, or they would use their own subcontractor separate. So you can actually tell Spree Work grips pretty easily based on the lines and the mold numbers from either Walther or Mauser. Also, Spree Work had an interesting bluing very dark, very black from the outset. But they never seemed to phosphate. And they very soon started leaving tool marks and lathe rings on their parts. In 1942 they only built about 700, at least delivered 700. But by 1943 they were up and running and they actually outproduced Walther, building a little over uh, 108,000. They would adopt some of the same changes as Walther, including the hump on the frame. In 1944, they would produce just a few less than Walther, around 127,000. Now, their serial system was also interesting. They used the code CYQ, but no two-digit year stamp, and they would just use CYQ 0 through 9999, and then roll it over, adding an A, and so on and so forth. And once they finally got to Z, they would just roll it back over with A again, but they would use a prefix instead of a suffix. And they would do A and B. And then their final block for the Germans was zero. And then they would actually do a small run for the Soviet regime with a two-zero code post-war. There... Waffen Amped code was 88. Now there have been claims from time to time that their spree work code was CVQ instead of CYQ, but most who study it agree that this was more due to a worn stamp or improper stamping or a broken stamp because the C, V, and CYs don't appear concurrently. But anyway, it's one thing to know. Um, if you see what looks like a V or a Y, both are correct. Now, one thing that kind of first appeared on Spree work was this cog hammer. Now, they didn't make it. This is from a subcontractor that even to this day we don't know. And while these are most common on late war Spree works, they do also appear on uh, late war Walthers. Where to stick that? Like this, and originally it was thought that Walther never did the, use the cog hammer, but enough have turned up by now as uh, old guns out of the former Soviet Union pop up. Also, all three makers would go to the stamped versus milled style slide release that was developed actually by Mauser. So if you want a crude fit and finish one, but still functional, the uh, Spreeworks might be up your alley. And they're purely wartime, 
war guns. No commercial flair to them, really. It's also worth pointing out that other subcontractors were used. For example, FN Herstel in Belgium. Now, you would think FN would use the code FNH. You would be incorrect on that. Most of the FN parts just had the AC code because they went, at least, were planning to go to Walther. So the way you tell an FN part from a Walther part is by the Waffenamt number. FNH as a code was actually assigned to, well, what we know today is CZ. And uh, these companies never made full guns, but you can find them on things like slides, locking blocks, and etc. And as I said, especially towards the end of the war, JVD would appear on some magazines, especially Mauser. And if memory serves, that company was Hungarian, but I could be wrong. In total, Spree Work would build a little over 280,000. With their final year, 1945, having built around 40, 41,000. So, actually, it's the smallest number of the three, but still a large number, all things considered. And finally, we come to Mauser. Mauser was ordered to cease P08 production in 1940, but the administration there kind of drug things out until 1942. They just weren't sure about this newfangled double action pistol and that decocker. That sounds scary. Sounds like a auto castration or something. I don't know. But. They didn't really have a choice. But once they got up and running, they took it serious. They started building pistols that fall. The first order was ready in November, and the first ones were accepted in December of 1942, but they too would only build 700. But in 1943, they quickly showed it, the other factories how it was done, building roughly 144,000 that year. Now, they would use the code BYF, they would use the date, 42, 42, 43, 44, but they would not start over with suffixes at the end of the year. They would just keep on A, B, C, D till they get to Z, and then they would roll back around to A regardless of the year. And they would awfully ha often have multiple blocks running at the same time. And they would mostly produce their own parts with the exception of maybe grips. The Waffen Amp for Mauser was 135. Later having the WA added. And early on they had military blued finish. Then they would go to the dusty blue as collectors call it. And then they would go to the matte military blue. In 1944, they would keep production up, building just a bit more at 145,000 pistols. This is why BOIF 44s are among the really the most commonly encountered guns. They would also introduce some innovations. They were the ones that came up with the stamped slide release. Although this one still has the machined one. There's also two different sizes of machined release. This one over here, the Grey Ghost has it. They would also start using phosphating more. Even using it on some major parts, producing what are known as... Uh, dual tone or two tone finish guns with uh, for example a blued barrel and a phosphated slide and they were the first to introduce the um, black molded plastic grips that Walther would later use too they're a soft shiny material 
And then, in 1945, they would have their factory code change from BYF to SVW. Some SVW 44s have been reported, but they seem to be anomalies, very small production, maybe in December. Most were 45. And they would continue on with production until the Mauser factory was captured by the Allies. At the end of the war, say in December of 1944, all the factories made economies to speed up production. And QC really had gone down at Walther. It was never super high at spree work to begin with, but it was even lower. Mauser, though, if you really pull just an average sampling of 10 guns from each factory at that time, the Mausers would probably still have the highest quality fit and finish. Mostly to do with finish, they did a little more final polishing. Fewer machine marks were left on their guns. The bluing was still, like I said, uh, well I should say the finish, was a mix of bluing and phosphating. But towards the end, they uh, really kept their standards up. They also helped steam streamline production using stamped parts and more modern techniques. And they had more skilled labor than uh, Spree work and even Walther. And then, of course, we come to the Grey Ghost here. A gun that I think just has a cool history. These are French occupation production Mausers. France ended up with the Mauser factory, and as early as May of 1945, June, they ordered Mauser to keep making guns for them. Car 98s, even some Lugers, but probably most famously, P. 38s because France needed guns. Now, Mauser would leave off under Nazi occupation, or I should say Nazi production, at the F block in the SVW uh, 45. And the French would pick up with occupation in the G block. And early on, they would use the black plastic grips. But soon they would go to these unique metal grips when those ran out. Now actually the pressed metal grips the concept, it was originally pioneered by Mauser during the war is an idea to save on petroleum but it was never really put into production and they pretty much were all phosphated guns whereas the wartime phosphate was more of a gray green and the Mauser French phosphate was more of a uh, darker gray, almost black, even a little bit shiny. They used a lot of leftover parts. Now, the French would use a star as their final proof acceptance, but quite a few 135 Waffenamped proofed parts were used in these, so you'll see Waffenamps still on these guns certainly early on. And they usually have late war features like the stamped release and barrels that have slave marks and all that. But they didn't ever do the cog hammer. And the metal grips definitely make them heavier. And they even went to the trouble of phosphating the magazines. <laughs> and a lot of times you'll see the JVD mags in these. And they would continue production well into 1946, even using the SVW-46 code. But then relations with the Soviet Union deteriorated, and technically, the Mauser producing guns for the French was in violation of the treaty. The Germans weren't in trouble, but the French were breaking treaty. So the factory was pretty much looted for whatever they could, and then bulldozed to the ground. And uh, they would take some parts back to France, and then later build them up as a few more P-38s, I think for French police is what's reported. And some of these, which are in the L block, can have blued finishes rather than phosphated. But there's a pretty small number, just a few hundred. In total, French production was around 55,000. So, not insignificant. And these would be issued 
to the Foreign Legion, but also just anyone going over to Indochina. And a lot of them were used in Vietnam and even captured by the Vietnamese. And some USGIs would capture them in turn, so some of them have very interesting stories. Under German authority, Mauser produced about 325,000 pistols, and like I said, another 55,000, give or take, under French. So including the well over 500,000, some say as much as 585,000 from Walther, the over 280,000 from Spreewerk, about 1.2 million P-38s were produced during and just after the war. And many would stay in service for decades after because it was a good design. Well, I sincerely hope you found this at least entertaining and maybe helpful. If you'd like to know more on the history and features, we have plenty of other videos. I just wanted to do this when I had a um, kind of full set here. Would have been nice to have an early spree work, but to be fair, the late ones are just more interesting. Uh, today, one of these is going to a fellow YouTuber, so you'll see on his channel. I'll let you guess which one he taught me into parting with. I'll give you a hint, though. It's not this one. I'm never going to let go of my HP. It is neat. You know, it's funny. A lot of people go for the Zero Series guns because Nazis. But far fewer were made for Sweden. And I love the M38, M, excuse me, M39 connection to Sweden. It fits in so well with my Swedish collection. And also, it won't be my Grey Ghost because this particular YouTuber has an aversion to things French. So that tells you immediately who it isn't, and probably who it is. <laughs> so it's one of the others. But yeah, I don't know. Just haven't talked about Walters in a minute, and thought this would be fun. And uh, apologies if I got anything wrong. Just kind of winging it here. But if you have any questions, please do post them, and do my best to answer them. And if you could, please like share and subscribe and if you'd like to help support us please check out the link to our patreon page this is misha and i'll catch you very soon next time